Okay, good morning. Um, my name is Karen Squire. I'm the Chief of Low Vision Services at Southern College of Optometry. And I primarily am hoping today to spend a little bit of time with you to talk a little bit about kind of getting into pediatric low vision. Um, it's a topic of clinical care that's very important to me and I think important to a lot of us. Um, and I'm hoping to kind of teach you a little bit about some of the things that I do and maybe um, kind of give a little bit of um, idea of some ways to kind of approach your exams. When we're looking at objectives um, for today, um, just for this um, short course, short time that we have together, the hope is, is that we're going to have a little bit better understanding of the epidemiology of pediatric low vision, um, have an idea to implement adaptations to traditional exam techniques for the pediatric population, understand considerations of prescribing devices for the pediatric population, understanding the implications of pediatric development and developing a pediatric rehabilitation plan. So that's kind of some of the things that we're going to take, kind of go over as we're working together today. So to kind of get an idea of where we're all at, um, we're gonna start with a poll question. Um, so this is the first question of the day. And the question is, what experience have you had with managing children with visual impairments or blindness um, in cl clinical practice? And we'll give everybody a few seconds to answer the questions. Okay, so it looks like we have a pretty good range of um, experience. Um, the majority of people, about 61%, say I see some children with low vision in practice. Um, there's a few that I've never had um, experience and there's kind of some that practice more with adults and a few that are very familiar with pediatric low vision. So hopefully um, we'll be able to kind of get something through this lecture that everybody's gonna be able to um, take away from today. So the first thing I wanted to talk about was just kind of the epidemiology of pediatric visual impairment. Um, it's a very important um, component to go over because it kind of dictates kind of what services and what's available for children. The hard part is that the true numbers and the actual epidemiology is difficult to track because each country uses a different system to track children with disabilities. Some um, countries use registered children, some use kind of using clinical data, so the actual um, true visual number of visual impairment differs kind of um, how each country um, submits their information. Also, sometimes how we define visual impairment may differ among different countries. So that can make kind of a little bit of a variation as well, using just a different level of acuity or different components like um, visual field issues may make some challenges as well. And then lastly, sometimes we lump in low vision and uncorrected refractive error into the same category. And when we're talking about low vision, we're essentially talking about visual impairment that remains after um, the refractive error is corrected. So if we lump in uncorrected refractive error, it does kind of change the scope of kind of um, the numbers that we'd be seeing. There are some important trends to kind of take a look at. First off, cortical vision impairment as a diagnosis is increasing. Um, medical care is improving dramatically um, for kids that have um, brain injury. So the survival rates are improving. So we're now having a population of children with this condition that is, that is surviving and then therefore um, increasing that need for um, rehabilitation. Additionally, nutritional causes of visual impairment are improving in some areas. Um, access to care is improving, um, especially we, we talk a lot about vitamin A deficiency as being a very significant cause of visual impairment. And by getting some treatment and care in that realm and kind of having more nutritional care that does improve some outcomes. And then lastly, what we're seeing is the prevalence of visual impairment is correlated to social economic status. So there's certain countries that may be more apt to um, report higher levels of the visual impairment due to the socioeconomic status. That's helpful to know because when we start targeting areas that need rehabilitation or need, assess need assistance in getting more care, we can kind of at least get an idea of where we need to target some of that effort. We're looking at the overall prevalence um, of registered blind individuals. Children are kind of coming about 2.2% of registered blind individuals and about 1.3% of partially sighted individuals. So it sounds like a low number, but these are people that are going to have a visual impairment throughout their lives. So that visual impairment is cumulative over the course of time. So these are people who are living with a visual impairment for a longer time. And we're looking at the World Health Organization. They do, they do a lot of great information about kind of um, statistics and kind of assessing where we need to kind of look to and, you know, um, change our strategies. And one of the things that they have noted is that low income countries with a high under five mortality rate, the prevalence is 1.5 um, per 1,000 children with higher income countries with a lower mortality rate, 
prevalence is much lower, it's about five times lower. So that's a significant difference, just kind of looking at two factors, the income um, of the country as well as mortality rates of the five and under um, uh, children population. And the estimation is about 1.4 million children that are blind worldwide. So that's a pretty significant number that we need to kind of work at to kind of make sure they have low vision services. We're also looking at the epidemiology of children's um, blindness. We kind of can use this um, study to kind of help out with um, figuring out what types of conditions that we're more likely to see in practice. And depending on the socioeconomic status, kind of like right here, the higher end, what we're gonna see are there's more conditions like retinopathy um, conditions, um, conditions such as that may affect the optic nerve. Um, for the lower income, countries, we may be more apt to see a difference in the shift, the prevalence. And one of the things to look at here are, are corneal conditions. Um, vitamin A deficiency is kind of one of the, again, the leading causes of visual impairment, and it creates a lot of corneal scarring. So we may see higher corneal, here we go, causes of, um, corneal causes of visual impairment. I kind of cut it off a little bit here too, but also lenticular or cataracts. Um, some countries have better access to surgical care um, and better access to their eye care provider. So some of those treatments may be initiated um, where in other countries they're not quite as, as available. And also access to primary health care, making sure that that child has general overall um, development in, clinical, in uh, their clinical development. When we're also looking at the different um, income levels of different countries, high income countries, the more common causes of visual impairment are retinopathy or prematurity, teratogens or those types of um, insults to the maternal, develop, maternal um, development that can cause um, problems with the, um, fetal development, um, cataracts and glaucoma. If we kind of shift down to the other side where we're looking at some of the lower income countries, um, corneal scarring again by far um, outweighs all the other causes of visual impairment. So, it's really looking at the access to care and the nutritional status of that child. Just a couple quick graphs here. Um, when we're looking at the overall number of pediatric blindness, the highest percentage of where those children are are in very poor countries. Almost 40% are in countries that have um, very um, poor um, health care services, um, access to health care services, I should say. And when we're looking at trends overall throughout the world, we're also looking at retinal causes as being the most common cause, and then corneal scarring comes right in behind it, as well as um, overall development of the whole globe. So kind of looking at that information, we can kind of get an idea of what type of impairments um, some of our children may have regionally and how we may need to change our rehabilitation plan. So we have another poll question to kind of get an idea of also where we're at with this. Um, in your practice, what is the most common cause of pediatric low vision that you encounter? Corneal disorders, cataracts, retinal disorders, hereditary disease, cortical vision impairment, or the ever ubiquitous other. Okay, so for the, it's kind of a mix across the board. Um, the most common, 32% is retinopathy prematurity or retinal detachment. Um, right behind that is cataracts at 27%. We have corneal disorders at 11%, hereditary diseases like albinism and RP at 14%, and cortical vision impairment at 16 So a pretty wide spread of the different conditions um, that we kind of expect in the pediatric population. Um, for people who had registered for this webinar today, I made a little graph of kind of where we all are coming from. And we have a good significant, about a third are from, a little bit over a third are from Asia, a little bit more from um, Africa, and then kind of throughout the other different countries, um, excuse me, not countries, continents. It's a little early here in Memphis, um, but the different continents, you can kind of see kind of where we're all located. Um, so it doesn't match up as much as I thought it might with some of the different conditions, but it's a kind of just an interesting um, correlation to kind of take a look at while we're here today. So when we're looking at why are the numbers important, there's a few reasons for that. One is, is the services that are available um, for kids in, in you know, school, in uh, government services, um, it's gonna be targeted by how many, number are, how many people are actually registered as having a visual impairment. So we need to make sure that we do have an idea of how many children are visually impaired so we can make sure they have access to the care and make sure they get, we have funding to um, support that care. The other thing is that we need to kind of start changing how we look at children with visual impairment as what they need for the year that we see them or at the time that we see them, 
but more related to how long that child will live with a visual impairment. So somebody, a four-year-old who's lost their vision is going to be visually impaired for their, for, you know, if they live to 70, a much longer time than somebody who um, loses their vision later in life. The reason that's important is we need to make sure that we have proper assessments um, and make sure that we have proper support for that child and to kind of develop kind of throughout their childhood and their adulthood. The other thing is we need to make sure that we have appropriate resources and access for the appropriate resources for development and access to technology. That's a very important thing to consider as we're working with kids and especially young adults because we need to make sure that they have everything to keep them up to pace with their, um, their normally sighted colleagues. And then lastly, when we're looking at looking at appropriate interventions, we have to make sure that we're looking not just at their visual acuity, but also their overall development, their social skills and how they interact in society. Economically, we know that people that are visually impaired have a tendency to um, have a higher unemployment rate and maybe not um, make as much money as their normally cited um, cohorts, as well as a psychological um, assessment as well, making sure that um, mental health is uh, addressed with kids and adults who have visual impairment. So, we need to make sure we have an idea of kind of where everybody's coming from. The other thing, I found this article, it was way back from 1977, 1978, so it's a long time ago, um, but it is kind of an important thing to look at because it kind of gave at least an idea of where, um, let me just move this out of the way, where kind of the funding goes to for um, kids that have a visual impairment while they're in school. So this um, study looked at how much funding and how many resources are kind of available for kids that have visual impairment. So for somebody who just has a handicap and that would be just visual impairment that affects their ability to do daily activities, it's a little over two times the cost of what it would be to um, educate a child with normal vision. If they become functionally blind, it's almost 5.68 per times more expensive. Functionally blind than having an itinerant special education teacher, so somebody's hired specifically to help them be able to um, help them be able to kind of succeed in the classroom much higher 6.78%. In 1977, the overall cost per child was a little over $11,000, but when we adjust for inflation, the cost goes up to about $50,000, which is a significant amount of money um, when we have um, to kind of consider how many kids in the, in the um, world are visually impaired and how many resources we need to kind of take a look at with them. So we spent a little bit of time looking at kind of the demographics and the epidemiology. We're gonna kind of start going into the examination. And the first thing um, that we wanna do is when we start the examination is kind of see how that child behaves in kind of in a new and novel environment. So you wanna do some observation of how that child's um, behaving. Other things you wanna make sure in your exam room that you don't have too many distractions. Um, additional distractions are gonna make it hard for that child to attend to the testing that you're gonna be doing. So you wanna make as little distractions as possible. Um, you want to take time to kind of just observe how that child interacts with the environment. Um, for a child that has, an, has a nystagmus, they may have a head turn or head tilt that they use when they're looking at something of interest. Additionally, as that child work, moves throughout the room, how do they adapt to visually challenging um, objects? Do they move closer to it? Do they find a way to get closer to that object of interest? Do they avoid it altogether? Or is there any squinting or closing of an eye to kind of make sure they're using only their better seeing eye? You also wanna see how that child responds naturally and normally to glare and lighting. Um, some conditions like albinism and achromatopsia, kids are super sensitive to light. So that might be something that you start to notice that they kind of put their hand over their eyes or they kind of squint a little bit more. And it's important to kind of um, make sure you assess that without kind of, just kind of see how they handle that naturally. This is a, um, from a clinic that I did. So this is, I broke my own rules. Um, I had, was between patients and I had um, everything that I own apparently out on this table. And this little girl who was at the table was so fixated on what my stuff was that she wasn't able to attend to her other exam. So it's one of those things, do as I say, not as I do. But this was a good lesson that I learned. Make sure you kind of clean up as you keep going along because any distractions will distract your child from your exam. Some other observations that you may notice um, before you start your examination are what we call manneristic behaviors. They used to be known as blindisms or kind of just some uh, movements or kind of repetitive behaviors that people with visual impairment, kids with visual impairments might, um, might display um, kind of as they're in their natural environment. It's not really something like, you know, a, a head turn or a head tilt in response to a nystagmus. It's more to kind of slow that nystagmus down and kind of improve vision. 
blindisms and manneristic behaviors aren't don't really have a purpose. There's not anything to kind of improve vision. It's just kind of a repetitive behavior, more as a coping strategy and an adaptation to vision loss. When people um, do display these, it can um, relate into a reduction of quality of life. You know, it is something that's different than other children their age are doing. Um, and it may relate to, uh, you know, children being treated differently, bullying, those sorts of things. So it, it's, it does have an impact in the overall quality of life. Some common manifestations that you may see are body rocking, where the whole body is moving from side to side or front to back. Eye poking, um, children sometimes poke their eyes to kind of get a response of a phosphine. Head banging, um, kind of banging their head from side to side, finger waving, and then also light gazing, kind of staring at bright light. So these are just some manifestations that you may notice um, while your child um, is in your room. Um, sometimes a level of vision might relate to the types of behaviors that kids um, exhibit. Visually impaired kids might poke their eyes or stare a little bit more. Also some body rocking you might see with that. Kids that are totally blind sometimes have a, a few different mannerisms and it's more likely to, they're going to pursue activities that kind of um, elicit like proprioception and vestibular behavior. So more like that, more body rocking, um, more head shaking, that sort of thing. There's not really a treatment to kind of improve the manneristic behaviors and typically kids grow out of them. They may not grow completely out of them, but they may reduce um, their um, perception over time. Um, the thing that to try to work with, with parents, because it's hard for parents sometimes to understand what's going on, is just to kind of find a way to kind of substitute another form of stimulation. Then that way that child finds another outlet to kind of get that um, stimulation um, through other purposes. There's not really any recommendation for psychotherapy or aversion therapy because it's not found to be successful or effective. And another thing you might want to talk about with your par patient, parents and patients is just that the more disabilities a child has, a multi-disabled -dis child may have mannerisms much longer and they, they may persist into adulthood, adulthood just due to the lack of um, developmental development. So just some things to kind of keep in mind as you're um, working with these children. So we start the case history, and case history is probably one of the most important parts of the examination. Um, you wanna make sure that you can get as much detail to put yourself behind that child's eyes and kind of see what their environment looks like so you can kind of predict any difficulties they may have. So your attention needs to be spent more to a child's daily routine, which is much different from the adults that we may see. Things about the home environment, school, hobbies and sports, all very important. Those are the big three that we kind of look at with kids. We also want to kind of look at everything in between, like getting ready in the morning, sorting clothes, how much, um, how much independent stuff is that child doing. Additionally, when you're asking your questions, they should be specific to a child, like visual complaints, level of independence, as well as support for performing tasks. Um, a lot of kids um, are going to have help with activities that we are hoping for them to be proficient in, but Things like, you know, natural, like getting a meal together or getting their clothes ready, they may have a lot of help from their parents, but as the parents and the child start to kind of work together and the child becomes more independent older, they're going to need a little bit of help on how to transition, how to learn those different tasks. So it's good to kind of get an idea as you're going through how many different tasks um, that child is able to do independently. We're talking about school. Um, children spend a lot of time in school, so it's good to get an idea of what problems that they may have encountered. Um, one of the big issues is copying information from a blackboard or a whiteboard, information at a distance. And it's good to know what kind of strategy that child uses. A lot of times we suggest walking up to the blackboard and a lot of kids are allowed to do so. But other strategies that aren't quite so great are copying from their friends or taking their friends' notebooks home and making notes from those. So that's some things you kind of want to figure out. How is that kid getting the information that they're needing to learn in school? Other things, the goals that students may have are reading textbooks like their peers, so using a traditional working distance rather than bringing things so close. Um, so that may be a goal and problem issue that your child is reporting during their examination. Um, are they using any accommodations? Um, are they using any magnification? Are they using large print? What else are they using to kind of help them read their textbook as a peer? And then handwriting or drawing. Um, handwriting is maybe um, a good indication of how well that child is able to write on a straight line, how they're able to kind of get their homework done. But it's also one of those things that we need to kind of take a peek at um, to see how that child is doing. Because a lot of handwriting um, and drawing are parts, especially very young development. It also helps us understand kind of what that child's facial awareness is. Because that way, um, we kind of have an idea of how not just like in their local space, but also in their global space. Um, maybe that child may have some spatial awareness issues that maybe need to be addressed with orientation and mobility. 
So we're looking at the history of low vision devices and services. It's important to kind of get an idea of a few different things. One is the services that child is getting in school and what year did they last get that service. So a lot of times a child might get orientation mobility when they move schools or if a problem's identified, it may have been a while since that child's gotten mobility issues. They may have had new issues. So it's good to know kind of what age, how old they were and when they, what services they got and how they worked out. Um, what were the outcomes and any additional referrals that that child may have um, garnered with um, their training that they got. Additionally, when we're looking at low vision devices and accommodations, what are they using currently and what have they used in the past and what's been working well and what's been a failure. It's not uncommon to find a device might work well in a school or in a clinic and then they get to school and find it's not quite as functional. So it's good to get that feedback of kind of what worked and what didn't. Other visual difficulties as well, depending on the patient's ocular condition, um, you're going to have some predictions of issues. Somebody with albinism, for instance, is going to have problems in brighter lights. Um, kind of looking through your observation, your history, you're going to have an idea of some other difficulties that may come along with specific conditions. And it's good to ask questions about glare and light sensitivity, night blindness, um, color vision issues are very important, especially with young kids, because they, a lot of their world in kindergarten and younger grades um, are a lot of colors. There's a lot of colors that teachers use. And so it's good to kind of get an idea of what that child's development is so that we can relay to the teacher what colors work and which ones don't. When we're looking at visual goals of children, children typically have different goals than adults. Um, and one of the one that we'll kind of see in our clinic is that kids have more of a goal of improving their distance vision. And that's more related to kind of being in a classroom setting and different types of social goals. Um, if a child goes out on a field trip and they're, we go to, they go to a zoo, it'll be much harder for that child to see the giraffes and the elephants from a farther distance. Um, so that might be something that we kind of talk about with kids, what kind of goals at a distance they might be able to see. As kids get older and their workload changes in school, reading becomes a much more prominent goal. So reading goals typically increase with age. Um, a child in kindergarten is going to have a short year task goal where somebody in sixth or eighth grade may have more prolonged and sustained reading. So it's important to kind of take a look at how that child's development changes, how they're able to achieve their goals and what their goals may be as they come in from year to year. So once we have our history, at least an idea of our history and where we're starting at, the next step that we're going to look at is visual acuity testing. And with kids, we have to kind of make some modifications because there are a lot of different tests that are available and figure out what the best one is going to be for that child. When we're looking at test selection, how we're going to test our child, it's important to look at a test that's going to be developmentally appropriate for that child when we see them. Um, because if you choose the wrong chart or choose a chart that's too difficult, you're going to get a lot of false negatives. And so what can happen in those situations is that you're going to get wrong answers or a worse acuity when actually the test just may be too difficult. So it's good to kind of test your child's response to optotypes before you even get started. So this chart over here is our LEA symbols. We use this a lot with kids um, because it has very crisp, very specific um, shapes. Um, we have a key card that's over here that if a child maybe is a little bit shy and they're not happy to tell you what they see, they can at least point. Um, so if you ask them to see what they see up here, they can point to that house um, and you know that they can see it and match it properly. Um, one other issue is this little guy here, the heart. Um, some people call it an apple. Some people call it an apple, some people call it a heart. It kind of goes back and forth. So it's one of those things to kind of get an idea of what that child would name all of those before you get into testing. On the right is our Allen optotype size. And when we're looking at the different shapes, these are a little bit old school, but they still work well. But some of the challenges are things like this phone here. A lot of our younger kids may have never seen a phone that looks like that. I mean, we use a lot of smartphones or other types of things. So this may not be a phone that is quite as common and so it's good to just kind of review that before you get into your testing. So some things that are going to factor um, into your visual acuity measurements are the types of procedures that you're, the procedure itself. Your testing distance is very important. Typically for younger kids, I test at a closer distance. Then that way we minimize distractions in the room and can make sure that that child's only attending on that one task. So the testing at a closer distance. How quickly and how you present your optotypes is also going to have an impact. 
you want to take your time with this because some kids are very quick with, part, with testing. Some of them are a little bit shy and a little bit anxious. They're not going to be able to attend very quickly. So you want to take your time. What we know also too is visual field status and lighting is going to have an impact on your acuity measurement. So it's good to kind of consider the pathology um, when you are doing your testing. So to make sure that if you need to adjust lighting or adjust the presentation of your targets to make sure that you do so um, as, you're, as you're doing your testing or you may get some false negatives. And then lastly, um, your child's response to patching or occlusion. We've all had that situation where we patch a child and they get very anxious and very upset. So it's good to kind of come up with a system that's gonna reduce anxiety as much as possible. Typically what I do is I test both eyes together and then that way the child's just using their natural vision. And then if I know which eye is the better eye, I test that eye next. Um, typically when you test, when you patch the better seeing eye and the child has to work with their worst seeing eye, they get very apprehensive and kind of get a little bit anxious. So it's important to be able to um, reduce anxiety as much as possible when you're doing your testing. There's a few different um, charts that I'm gonna go over um, to kind of use and everybody has their personal preference. I like using Keller Acuity Cards. It's a preferential looking test. It has a wide range of acuities. It can be tested at, a, at several different distances. Um, 38 centimeters, 55 centimeters, 84 centimeters. So you can kind of adjust your um, working distance and still get pretty good measurements. Um, the nice thing is, is also is that you can correlate it to a Snellen equivalent. So it doesn't necessarily correlate to a Snellen acuity, but at least an equivalent Snellen equivalent, excuse me, equivalent, yeah, equivalent Snellen equivalent, um, to kind of get an idea of where that child's vision is. Because a lot of people, even though they may not understand what exactly 2040 acuity means, they at least know whether or not it qualifies that child for services. So I included the calculation for this, how it works, um, is essentially you have your Snellen denominator of your acuity, and you use this equation over here to calculate your cycles per degree, and that's gonna give you a measurement of Snellen acuity. So if you have your, your patient sees 19 um, cycles per centimeter, you're gonna plug that into this calculation here. It's gonna be 20 times 30 divided by 19, and it's gonna give you about a Snellen denominator of about 31.6. So your child's acuity with that level of vision is gonna be about 2032. The reason why I included it is I can find this calculation rarely when I need it. So hopefully just having this available to you um, would help you um, in future um, times that you use this acuity chart. Additionally, um, there's Patty Stripe. So it's kind of the same concept. It's just a paddle rather than those large cards. If you ever have held a box of Teller Acuity cards, they're very heavy. So they're not very portable. These paddles do exactly the same thing. Um, and you essentially um, can take these with you wherever you go. It doesn't have the wide range of acuities but it does typically work well enough to be able to um, have a few different options for you and take them kind of with you wherever you go. Cardiff cards are another um, type of preferential looking card that you can use. Um, they have these shapes that are over here and they correlate to different levels of acuity. The range is a little bit um, narrow where it only goes up to about 2160 and to about 2012.5. So these are kids that maybe have higher functional vision um, and maybe not going to not encompass the entire range of acuity that we may see in our clinics, but it's at least another test that's available that a lot of people have been coming, it's becoming more popular to use. I haven't used it very much, um, but when I have used it, it's more for the kids that have a higher level of functional vision. Um, but it's a, it's a personal preference when you start looking at cards. When you're looking at um, kids that maybe have higher visual development, there's distance vision charts, we can use LEA acuity charts and just use the shapes. Um, that sometimes is a little bit better for kids that have, um, they're a little bit more aware of shapes that are available. Um, HOTV chart, we're just using four different letters and kind of cycling all the way through. This is also another great way to kind of present um, letters at a distance for a child. And then the fine bloom chart, um, it's not everybody's favorite chart to use. I did my residency at the Fine Bloom Center, so I'm a little bit partial. That being said, um, the nice thing about the Fine Bloom chart is it's only numbers. So some children maybe are more developed with their numbers um, than they are with letters when they see you. So that might be a good chart to be able to use for those as well. For near uh, acuity charts, the same types of things as distance, the single optotypes, the shapes, and the letters. Um, a lot of the distance charts are now mirrored um, at near. So when um, you do look at a near acuity chart, it's good to kind of get an idea of um, if you're using a distance chart to kind of mirror that at a near distance as well, because you know the child's going to be successful and they've had some practice with it. 
some kids have a little bit difficulty with crowding. So you may have to kind of block or occlude um, a letter or a line at a time. So feel free to use something like a post-it note, use your hands or even a line guide to isolate a line or a letter. And that might give you some better results as well. The next card um, that I'll talk about for near that's important to look at is a continuous text card. This is gonna be um, a card that essentially has sentences um, and has some context. And this is a, sometimes we kind of overlook this with kids because as long as we know we can see the letter, they'll kind of work well with um, sentences and, and paragraphs if, if we give the same, same device at home. And it's not always the case. Um, we need to make sure that our children are reading at an appropriate, we're gonna talk about reading rates in a little bit. Um, what the nice thing about this continuous text card is it has sentences that um, kids can, we can see how their visual, um, how their eyes kind of coordinate looking across the page, how quickly they read and see if we need to make any modifications with the printing. We also have some information about comprehension. So it's one thing to be able to read the words, but are they comprehending? And that's an important concept that sometimes we don't always pay as much time, pay, spend as much time as we should um, with children. So we need to kind of take a look at that making sure we're using a developmentally appropriate chart when we're looking at continuous text. So when we're looking at acuity measures, we may have some kids that just don't have um, that level of acuity to kind of participate in other care. So we have fixate and follow, just following a moving target or a transilluminator. Pupillary responses, do we have light perception um, at least? And then OKN responses. So using the OKN drum, by turning that drum, we can see if we can elicit um, an okay and an nystagmus type of response to see if that child's actually able to see that type of print. The important thing is to move that drum slowly because if you move it too fast, it's just going to blur and it won't um, create the response you're looking for. With entrance testings, some of the things that we're going to take a look at um, when we're looking at alignment, when we're doing um, extraocular muscle movements, we also want to look for null points for kids that have nystagmus. We wanna make sure that we're not going too fast with this because if you go too quickly, you're gonna lose some of the visual attention that that child has. So you wanna make sure that you're moving at an appropriate pace. Sometimes if I have a child who's not really doing well with the light, I'll kind of have them move their finger in space and I'll kind of show them what I want them to do. That gives kind of the benefit of proprioception, like kind of knowing where their finger is in space and being able to follow that target. Um, and usually they're not a little bit less apprehensive. Sometimes it can put a little, like a little puppet on the top of it and that kind of makes it a little bit fun as well and just kind of verbally directing the gaze in a different directions. We also want to take a look at alignment. Do we have a strabismus that we're dealing with? Um, so we want to do cover test or maybe Hirschberg assessment. Cover test, the important thing to realize is whatever near target you're using or distance target, making sure the child can see that same target in both eyes. Sometimes we use a target that's too small and we're not going to be able to pick up fixation. And so that in that situation, we lose the benefit of that alignment assessment. Um, pupils are um, an important part to look as well. Um, the reason why I included this is, you know, we look for the neurologic response, but we also want to see what the pupils do in response to bright light. If you have somebody who has large pupils that don't respond well, that's going to be somebody who has significant glare issues. So um, some conditions may cause a slowing of the constriction response with pupils. And so it's important to kind of make sure that um, if you do see some sort of condition that may create glare, it's important to um, address that as well. Also, um, when we're looking at um, modifications for kids that are a little apprehensive, when you have that light kind of flashing toward them, kind of just simulate the movement with a puppet, and then that might help with um, kind of getting them used to something being closer to their face, and then you just add the pen light in on top um, or underneath the puppet, and that'll help give you some responses. Color vision is incredibly important to look at as well. Some of the modifications for that, um, when we're doing the arrangement test, that's more for somebody who has a very good visual development and cognitive development. So the arrangement test that sometimes we use the large um, D15 uh, test plate might be a little bit of a challenge, um, but something to kind of consider for kids as well. Um, color matching and naming, also an important, just a gross assessment of color vision as well as color plates. Um, I included this one because Ishihara is one of those um, that has a great color plate where you can see if your child can actually follow um, the shape in, in, on the plate. Um, so somebody who's nonverbal or maybe a little bit shy, they may not wanna tell you what the number is on the other plates, but they can at least follow that snake in the grass or find that worm. Um, and that might be able to get them to kind of participate a little bit more um, frequently. Um, side vision assessment, a lot of our kids do not do well with standardized um, visual field assessments. So it's a good thing to make sure that you have different ways to assess um, visual fields. 
Um, one is, is just doing confrontation fields and standard procedure, kind of using your fingers off to the side or give me a high five in different fields of gaze. Um, we sometimes use this device, it's called the vision disc, and it kind of gives you at least a measurement of kind of, oops, press that button a little bit early, but it gives you a good idea of the degrees of measurement that are off to the side. That's an, just a gross assessment there. Other ways is that you can have one of your colleagues stand behind um, the child and bring objects from the side. Um, and depending on how the level of vision, you can use something that's a little bit bigger or something that's a little bit smaller, depending on their visual ability. Also, somebody who has a cortical vision impairment, their visual development may be a little bit slower. So using something that maybe has a rattle in it, um, so you have auditory and visual stimulation, we kind of show both and try to get that child to kind of look into that other field of gaze. So you can use a lot of different targets when you use this type of methodology. So we're looking at visual deficits. Um, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of issues that we're seeing with kids that are in like a special education setting. And this study that Black and their group did kind of looked at different areas of deficits. And we kind of look at the different percentages of things that we're seeing. Refractive error um, is the most common that we're seeing. We're also seeing reduced contrast, which is something that we don't always test for um, in children and in a primary care setting. So it's good to kind of get an idea that we need to look for this as well. Reduced acuity, anomal anomalous eye movement, so saccadic issues or atropia. Visual processing, which is also another thing we don't always test for in a primary care setting. Um, and it also that kids present a lot of times with more than one deficit. So it's not uncommon to see, or maybe it's not as uncommon as we thought, to see a couple different combinations of issues that patients may have. So we move on to refraction. Um, since we're all um, eye care providers, we know how important refraction is. Um, and it's probably one of the most crucial parts of the assessment because we have to get a good assessment of kind of where, how much blur is related just to uncorrected refractive error. Important things to keep in mind when you're doing retinoscopy, um, I suggest using scoscopy bars. This is helpful because you can stay outside of the phoropter and see what that child's doing. For fixation, you can use things at a distance like a video that you might be able to play, having parents or staff members sit at a distance. Um, and you may also need to adjust your working distance. You may have to, if somebody has really high corneal scarring or significant cataract, you may need to do dynamic ret and get a little bit closer. Don't be afraid to do damp retinoscopy. Um, it's important to um, get a good reflex and some kids that over accommodate, you might over um, minus them and over plus them. So you wanna make sure that you do an appropriate retinoscopy assessment and damp ret will help you kind of at least get a full picture of what that's going to be. Some conditions um, present with certain refractive errors that are pretty common. Um, albinism, you're gonna see a lot of with the rule astigmatism. The range of myopia, hyperopia may vary but astigmatism is gonna be common. That also goes the same with anybody that has that pendular nystagmus. So congenital nystagmus, achromatopsia, those kinds of conditions will create a with the rule astigmatism. Other things, um, Down syndrome, we might see moderate to high myopia. With our kids, microophthalmus, because the eye is just so short, we're gonna see a lot of high hyperopia. And ROP, we're gonna see high myopia. So this is a good table to kind of get at least an idea of maybe if you haven't worked with these populations of kids, what to maybe look for when you um, are doing refractions. It helps kind of guide you if you start to see something that's a little bit different. When we get through refraction, we have an idea of their best corrected acuity. We have an idea of goals, and we're kind of starting to look at the low vision rehabilitation portion at that time. Um, I included this study for a couple of reasons. Um, it's a small sample of kids. It's only 22, but the age is a range of two to six. And there are some interesting things that I saw in this study. First off, is they were able to obtain appropriate measurements with kids this age with visual acuity, visual field, contrast, and color vision. So we can at least get some sort of assessment of those. Um, sometimes we will wait till you get older or wait till they're more developed before we try these things, but it's important to kind of realize that we can get these measurements on young kids. Additionally, when we're looking at prescribed devices, about half were prescribed near, a little bit over half were prescribed distance devices, 40% were prescribed both. But the other thing we need to keep in mind is almost 30%, just under 30% were prescribed pre-device instruction. So these parents got in information about um, what devices are and the kids got a chance to use them. So even though we weren't prescribing, they at least got the chance to kind of see where, what devices would be helpful as that child develops. So we may not pre be prescribing for those really young kids, but we can at least educate the parent and the child of what's available when they need it as they go forward. 
So with low vision with kids, there's a few different strategies that we use that are pretty common. Um, relative size magnification, where we just make the object itself bigger, we make the print substitute for a larger print. So using, this is just regular size playing cards, and what we can do is just substitute it for something that has something that's a little bit larger. So what, how we use this with children is essentially with using large print books, regular, rather than a regular small print book that the child may be using, substitute it for large print. Um, additionally, we can use larger print, larger monitors. So if a child using a closed circuit TV, just getting a monitor that's a little bit larger than their typical screen, computers and iPads with larger screens as well. Also, when we're making suggestions back to the teacher, we want to talk about large print um, tests, making sure homeworks are, homework assignments are enlarged, as well as textbooks, again, being large itself. And then also maybe using a thicker pen versus a pen or a pencil. Just anything where that object that that child's looking at is larger is going to be really helpful. Another option that we have for improving magnification and visual ability for kids is using relative distance magnification, just by getting closer to that object. We we'll use it for some of our different strategies, but just moving closer to an object itself makes it a lot bigger, a lot easier to see. So this is a water bottle sitting across um, the room on a table in my office. And just by getting closer to it, the retinal image size becomes much larger and much easier to see. So some things that we can suggest for children. For kids, um, bringing their reading material closer um, or getting that child to get closer to an item of interest. So getting up to go copying some, something down from the blackboard, getting up and going to see the clock in the room to see what time it is. When we're making recommendations for children, we want to talk about preferential seating where that child can sit closer in the front of the, the classroom going to an assembly, sitting in the front row of the bleachers, making sure that child has a better seating position so that we can benefit from relative distance magnification. And we also want to encourage, if a child is holding things closer to see, we want to encourage that because um, a lot of parents are afraid that that's going to be something that hurts the eyes, but we know with normal accommodation that it helps that child see much better. If need be, we can always prescribe reading glasses to be able to kind of alleviate some of that accommodative demand and make things a little bit more comfortable. So when we're looking at prescribing, um, there's a few things that we need to take a look at when we're starting to calculate the devices that we're going to be looking at. And we are going to calculate a couple of different object, different types of devices. It's just helpful to kind of take a look at. One is you want to make sure that you take into consideration the unique characteristics of a child in their environment. So the classroom that they're in the homework that they're doing and then hobbies and extracurricular activities. All of those things are going to be very specific to that child and those are the things you want to keep in mind when you're looking at prescribing. You also need to have an idea of where to start um, when you're looking at devices because kids lose attention quickly and so you need to be quick. So when we're looking at a device like a telescope, it's important to kind of have an idea of what starting point you're going to be looking at. So you can kind of do a quick calculation of the, the, what the patient's seeing, kind of what their goal print is, and create a ratio to see what power that they're going to need to be able to take a look at. So with the magnification, you look at the patient's current best corrected acuity, and you divide that by their goal acuity, what they can see, divided by what they want to see, and that's going to give you a magnification level for that child to be able to see, or at least a telescope to kind of start with. So when we're looking at a telescope example here, we have our patient's best corrected acuity is 2400 and their goal is 2050. So we do what we did before, their best corrected acuity, what they can see, divide by 2400, by what they want to see, 50. And we're going to do our quick calculation that's going to give us to 8x. So essentially, you're going to start your telescope evaluation with an 8x to, to meet their goal. So I have a poll question where we're going to try this out and we'll see um, how this works for um, for you to see what you're able to calculate with that. So let's give this a shot. Patients back to corrected visual acuity is 2200. You want them to be able to see text on a blackboard, which is equivalent to 2040. What telescope power would you start with to meet this goal of seeing 2040? Perfect. We have 5x is the correct answer, and just about everybody got it correct. So we are in good shape. So essentially, you're taking that 200, what they can see, divide by what they want to see, that 40, and that's going to give you 5x. So when you're looking at the types of telescopes that are available, it's going to be dictated by your child's goals and what they want to be able to see. I do a lot of handheld devices um, with, our, with kids. Um, just They can wear it as on a lanyard around their neck and just kind of have it available kind of as they need to. Um, binoculars, sometimes 
we'll kind of prescribe binocular devices for kids. Even just using a pair of binoculars that you might get at a sporting goods store is also helpful as well um, because it helps keep everything nice and steady as they're going through. You can custom design a telescope, um, but usually I like to see how a child responds to the distance magnification first before going down that road of a, of a prescription, de prescription device. Oops, sorry. For near assessments, um, when we're looking at prescribing a near device, we kind of do another quick calculation as well. Um, and essentially we're using that same type of ratio, what they can see divided by what they want to see. And you times that by the inverse of their working distance of what they came in seeing. This gives you an equivalent power that's going to help them be able to meet their goals of the print that they want to be able to see. So for instance, you have a six-year-old who reads 0.4 over 4M with normal accommodation. He wants to see a comic book print equivalent to 1M. So he can see 4M. He wants to see 1M. He times that by the inverse of that working distance. So 1 over 0.4 is going to be 2.5. That's going to give you 10 diopters. So essentially a 10 diopter equivalent, whatever device that you should happen to use, should get that patient to be able to meet their goal of 1M. So it's important kind of quick calculation to be able to do. Um, those, the telescope and this one are the two primary ones that I use and then I spend most of the time kind of working with the different devices. Devices available for kids, there's a lot that's out there that we may use, um, but these are kind of the basic ones that I typically use. Stand magnifiers and dome magnifiers are great because they just line up on the print. We don't have to worry about dexterity of like a handheld device. Kids that have um, contrast issues, we could always show them an electronic device to kind of help out with enhancement of contrast. There's a lot of options that are available that may be helpful for your kids. I'm going to skip over this example and I'm going to go straight to this one. So with estimation of print size, a lot of kids are going to come in with things like homework or maybe a book they need to read. And that's going to be their goal, but it may not match up perfectly with a near car that has an equipment. Uh, specific um, acuity notation like 2040 or metric notation. So what we can do is we can at least estimate the print size by doing a simple quick calculation. So what we would do is we would look at kind of what our normal metric letter size is, which is typically 1.45, and we use that kind of as a scale to measure um, what metric notation um, acuity size our patient would be, so our, our patient needs to see. So we measure the height of the letter, we divide that by 1.45, and that's going to give us our estimated M notation size. So this example here, um, what we're going to look at is that letter D that's up on the top. I'm just going to zoom in a little bit for you. And we measure from the top to the bottom of that letter D, it's going to be about 6 millimeters. So if you divide that by 1.45, it's going to give us about an equivalent of like 4.1 M notation. And then that would become our goal um, when we're calculating our near um, acuity uh, or near equivalent power devices. So that's essentially how I would use kind of a simple thing like a ruler and, and converting it into a metric notation to use as a goal print um, calculation. So we'll do a quick poll question here, kind of measuring that exact same thing. A child is having difficulty reading text in a book is not available in large print or via a tablet. Since this is the goal print, you want to determine the appropriate optotype size uh, to ensure your equivalent power calculations will be accurate. You measure the print size to be 4.35 millimeters in size. What's the closest M acuity size of this print? 1M, 2M, 3M, or 4M? Okay, so we have a couple of, bit of a range of kind of the answers on this one. What we're going to do is we're going to look at this 4.35 letter size, and then we're going to divide that by our 1.45, and that's going to give us a 3M size calculation. So that becomes then our size calculation for our equivalent power. So my email's at the end of the presentation. If you have any more questions about that, feel free to email me about it. We're going to move on to the next things, but um, please, of course, let me know if you have any other issues with that calculation. Uh-oh. Oh, here we go. Okay, so when we're talking about reading for children, um, kids as they go through development are going to be reading more and more and more. And so a lot of times children will compensate for decreased vision by using relative distance magnification, by bringing things closer, and that helps resolve the visual detail. The challenge is, is that when we do that, there's no task lighting, um, there's no contrast enhancement, postural problems, kids kind of hunch over and their shoulders get sore, and just the cosmesis, it looks different. So that's why a lot of times we do need to look at some sort of uh, assisted device like a magnifier or other type of approach to help kids be able to see up close. Um, with, there's a couple of studies that I've 
looked through and looking through a few different pieces of information that were interesting was that kids with low vision can approach reading rates of normally sighted children with appropriate magnification. So using the appropriate power and appropriate type of device, they can get it to be reading almost as close as almost as quickly as normally sighted children. And in another study, Corn et al. found that using magnification device or assisted devices have a tendency to improve their reading rates over time, where kids that only use large print have a tendency to plateau. And that's important to realize because not every book is going to be available in large print or not every um, resource will be available in large print. So it's important to make sure that as we're kind of going forward, we're introducing devices so kids can keep up with their reading rates that they need to to keep up with their classwork, classroom work. Um, with children, with reading rates and kids, um, as reading rates will improve as kids get older. Um, reading rates typically increase about 10 words per year in visually impaired and about 14 words per minute in normally sighted. So there is a little bit of a gap, but it's not very significant per year. Cumulative, cumulatively over time, it is pretty significant. So it's one of those things we want to keep in mind um, when we're looking at appropriate uh, assessing devices. With a lot of um, classroom activities, depending on what age that child is and what year they're in in school, different um, reading rates are gonna be more appropriate. For uh, a younger kid in third grade, 60 words per minute might be okay. But as we get older, that, might, that reading rate may not be appropriate given the volume of reading. So it's important to kind of make sure that as you kind of are assessing children from year to year, you're listening for a reading rate um, so that you can at least get an idea, are they going to be able to keep up with the volume of work that they're going to be able to do kind of as they're going forward. Other options that you have for children are smartphones and tablets. Um, kids are a lot quicker to pick up technology. Um, so it's one of those things that it's kind of inherent to kind of as their normal development. Kids typically learn by trial and error. So they're very quick and they're very um, apt to pick things up with technology. Um, additionally, when we're looking at smartphones and tablets, there's a lot of opportunities to enhance the vision. Um, one is the contrast enhancement, large print. Also, it's a lot cheaper to kind of uh, use one device that can do multiple things. So if you have a smartphone that can be a teles telescope, use it for reading, it's going to reduce the cost and make things a lot easier for um, parents and the school districts that may be providing these devices. Lastly, it also keeps with the concept of inclusivity where everybody has that possibility of kind of being included in a, in a um, activity because they all have the same device. So it's one of those things that we're looking at smartphones and tablets are becoming much more to the far, the forefront of, a, of available devices. Some things to keep in mind also, a lot of kids are gonna have, they're not gonna maybe complain about it, but they're gonna talk, they're gonna have issues with glare. So it's important to look at glare control as well as UV protection. Um, other things to look at too are tints and kind of making sure you're using filters to kind of block out some additional light. Disability glare is additional glare that reduces visual quality and we want to reduce disability glare as much as possible. So just using something like a, a yellow filter for indoors, a gray filter for outdoors may be helpful. A wrap lens is one, a wrap frame might be helpful or a fit over. It depends kind of on your child. Other things here are tinted contact lenses. Um, this, this is me, this is, clearly isn't a child, but um, clearly not a child, but um, if you look over here, I'm wearing a tinted contact lens. It's just a dark blue and it helps just take a lot of the extra glare in the room. Cosmetically, it is a little bit different, but it, didn't, it was actually pretty visually comfortable um, after I wore it for a little bit and it wasn't as uncomfortable to wear as I thought it might be given, my, given using history of um, tinted contact lenses in the past. When we're looking at um, our rehabilitation team, um, we wanna make sure that we're kind of keeping everybody on board when we're um, working with children. So making sure that we're communicating with it, making sure that child has orientation mobility training as needed as they go through school, having access to a vision teacher who can help coordinate services in the classroom. Social work and school psychology are very important with the mental health as well as development of the, inner, the education plan that, that child may need. And we also want to make sure that we're communicating with the managing eye care physician and primary care physician to make sure that any medical needs um, are being addressed and anything that kind of stands out that might be different are also being addressed as well. So when we work with a child, there's always going to be a team that's involved and make sure that we're taking care of that as well. 
I added a couple slides about having um, the vision clinics in schools. Sometimes it's hard for children to come to us, so it's um, sometimes appropriate to um, develop clinics in schools. Um, and it's something that I did when I lived in Chicago. We'd go to classrooms and be able to see how children interacted, be able to prescribe devices in that natural environment. Um, it's also a great way that you have that access to the vision teachers and O&M specialists. So it's a different clinic than maybe what you might typically do, but it's a great way to kind of get to that child and be able to, treat, to assess them in their normal environment. That's very important um, rather than kind of in your clinic, which might um, give you a little bit different results. Um, there was a study that looked at um, prescribing devices and wearing glasses and kind of the outcomes of that. Um, few months after the clinic, um, what the, um, the surveyors found is that not everybody was wearing their glasses, not everybody was wearing the prescription that they had been prescribed, and some of them had very significant prescriptions. Teachers, though, had a very positive feedback. They thought that there was a change um, in children's engagement, but in some kids, the behaviors were not significantly changed. Um, kids were not visually engaged with tasks, or they kind of stayed off task. So this may be one of those things that maybe the, the follow-up was too soon after or maybe it was too far away that there wasn't as, as much intervention kind of going forward as they had hoped. One other thing that we want to take a look at is report writing. Um, you want to do a summary and make sure that you're, you're communicating to everyone that when you're working with a child to make sure that anybody who needs to know what the results of your examination have access to it. Um, it's also consider when you're writing that report, make sure you know who's reading it or at least consider it as you're writing that report. Um, a lot of things that we do, we translate our findings. Um, so when we talk about a child being 2200, that's helpful. Um, but what we can be much more helpful to somebody who doesn't know what 2200 means is actually measuring the size of that 2200 letter or better yet, even making a copy of that 20 and sending a copy with the report. So that, that teacher or the vision teacher, whoever's working that child can see exactly the size of the letter that child can see and then let them know what distance. It's helpful to talk about contrast loss and implications as of contrast loss because a lot of people don't understand contrast sensitivity. So mobility issues, facial recognition, it's important to translate what that means. And then prognosis as well as the recommendations that you might have for that child. And whenever you're going through your terminology, make sure you're addressing appropriate terminology for the reader consider what you might report back to a doctor versus a parent. So it's gonna change kind of the scope of what you, and also the terminology that you um, write as well. So I wanted to kind of finish up with a few things. Um, the parents and guardians, you need to keep them involved um, and active in their, um, in their child's rehabilitation and in their care. So it's good to kind of get an idea, of what do they know um, about their children's eye care and the care that they're getting? So there was a study that kind of used a very specific questionnaire just looking at eye care and some of the results were kind of a little bit staggering. So where are patient parents getting their information about their children's vision and their health? 70 per, not quite 70% are getting their information reporting that they're getting their information from their eye care providers. Other areas that they're getting are the internet, family and friends, television, but it's not even 70%, it's just not even 70% that people are getting information from us, the eye care provider. So that's an important thing to keep in mind as we're doing our education. Impacts on the quality of health literacy are if the parent's first language is not the language they're being educated in, that might have an impact education level, high school or lower. And I was kind of surprised, income didn't necessarily surprise me very much, but it was 70,000 was the benchmark. because I thought that was actually pretty high. But um, the 70,000 was found to be kind of like that level of where health literacy may drop off. When we're talking about health literacy with patients, parents and their guardians, we wanna make sure that they're included in the rehabilitation care. We wanna make sure that they know the resources that are available and how they can help um, their child at home and the carryover from home. So sometimes I'll use something like a vision simulator to kind of mimic what that, the child's impairment is or kind of a, somebody who's a 10 diopter myope, I'll give the parents plus 10 to hold over their glasses and see what their child is experienced. Anything to kind of get them to put them in the vision of their children so they understand the impact of what we're doing. It's always important to talk about what resources are available. Even if they're not maybe necessary at the time you see the child, they may be necessary going forward. And then one last thing about the health literacy of parents. Um, one of the issues that we do see that sometimes when we're asking parents why they maybe don't understand or maybe some issues they may report, is that medical terminology may not be translated. So maybe not understanding the medical terms that we're using. And sometimes when we get into a situation where we have a lot of patients, 
we're moving a little bit quicker, sometimes we forget to translate. Sometimes parents are embarrassed to ask questions. I think we all have been in that situation too. We're embarrassed to kind of raise our hand and say that we don't know something. So we want to make sure that um, we do provide an environment where, where patient, parents feel comfortable. Poor recall of related information, just forgetting what they've been told. And then receiving information verbally versus taking home information. When they received information verbally, 40% of patient, patients, parents forgot, I said patients, should be parents, forgot or misunderstood the information from the eye care provider. So that's a pretty significant percentage of information that we're providing that maybe isn't um, being um, digested and kind of um, reviewed kind of after we leave. And so we feel like sometimes maybe we're given a little bit of a lot of information, but maybe we need to look at different formats to kind of help our, make sure our parents are involved in that situ in that part of the um, counseling portion. I think that's it. I think I ran a little bit over, but I'm happy to answer any questions if any questions are um, available. Great. Thank you, Dr. Squire. If you stop your screen share and open up the Q&A, we have about five questions. Oh, did I do it? Oh, here we go. Okay, so the first comment was, I saw a case of a boy who was diagnosed to have cortical blindness and was already attending a blind school and a very good drummer. Currently now he's developed a hearing disability. He can no longer play the drums because he can't hear the singer sing. What do you recommend for his rehabilitation? Um, this is um, this an interesting question. Um, one of the things you know, we kind of look at our primary senses of being vision, then we look at auditory, um, and then kind of going forward from that, it's touch, you know, smell, um, that sort of thing. If, depending on the vision that he has, and it's hard, cortical vision impairment is one of those conditions where there may be um, the ability to have better visual development. He may see the drums, but when we test him on an acuity chart, his vision may not be appropriate, so he may be able to see keeping in time or the next step would probably be doing more tactile, um, like kind of feeling um, where that um, uh, kind of getting the sense of feel um, with the drums, that might be something to kind of uh, look towards kind of to keep him engaged in that activity. Um, that's a tough one. When we start to have multiple impairments, that's a hard thing. But when one impairment that we've relied on begins at a later age, that makes the rehabilitation much more challenging. But I start to look at vision as well as going back to vision as well as looking at touch and kind of feeling the rhythm of the drums as that might be a possibility. Okay, um, next question. Are there any specific recommendations for substitution of mannerist behaviors? Are there specific substitution strategies which are more effective than others? Um, when I read, there's a couple articles that I read that kind of went, talked about, you know, different types of substitution kind of looking at different activities um, instead of just keeping that child typically has that response kind of in a normal un, um, active, inactive setting, kind of giving different activities to kind of have that child do. So kind of maybe something that was um, more auditory to do or maybe giving them a task to kind of get them involved in. Um, those were some of those different strategies to kind of um, work with. The article that I have, um, I think the um, well, it should be, um, list the uh, reference should be listed, but there's one specific article that I found that was really helpful and really well explained a lot of the different strategies from beginning to end of manneristic behaviors. And I can send it to you um, if you're not able to access it so you can get a little bit more information of what some of the authors had suggested. Um, let's see. In low resources area, how can I start a low vision service? So there are so one of the great things that I'll say, first off, Orbis is a great place where you can get education about the different types of um, uh, just getting low vision understanding and that sort of thing. In starting a service, part of it is, is communicating with doctors in your area, um, making sure they know that you have an interest in doing that because a lot of patients, a lot of doctors don't necessarily know who to refer to, so they don't refer at all. So if somebody knows that you're willing to kind of start this type of service, that's a great thing. The second thing would be getting devices that would be appropriate um, for the population that you're seeing. So handheld magnifiers, maybe a few telescopes. You don't have to get a whole kit, but maybe just a few devices to start with 
And then as you start to see patients, you can start to see, well, where do I need to get more devices that would be appropriate? The other thing that I would recommend is working with your local schools um, and working directly with them. Um, that way you can make sure that you can help out with getting information about um, the children they need help with. They may also have resources of devices as well. Um, and then finally, um, funding. Sometimes that's, that's the hardest part of making a sustained practice, um, making sure you have funding to cover devices. But sometimes talking to your local government as well as talking to local um, um, charitable organizations, talking to churches, Lions Clubs if they're in the area will also be helpful to get devices and kind of help fund devices kind of as you're going forward. Um, so that it's a lot to kind of get started and I applaud you for looking to start that area but starting simply with making sure that you know what you need to know and then kind of communicating with the doctors and the schools in the area and then just getting a few small devices to start with and then just kind of building from there. Everything starts small and it's going to be, feel like it's slow, but it will grow rather quickly because once somebody finds out that you want to do low vision, they will absolutely refer to you as well. Okay. Um, next question. What about children with constricted visual field and use of magnifier that essentially result, for example, in less visible reading text in the remaining visual field. So with constricted visual fields, what you want to do is maximize the field that's available. And with glaucoma and RP and ushers as well, there's a challenge that when you start to you do lose field, but you also have a problem with contrast. So the remaining field may be a good acuity, but maybe the quality of the vision is reduced. You want to kind of look at things like reverse contrast if you can. Um, video magnifiers are usually a little bit more helpful. Um, specific, looking at task lighting to make sure that you can enhance the contrast that's there. Um, in some situations, depending if the field is very, very advanced, um, what you may want to consider is supplementing some information with auditory formats. So maybe using the vision for spot reading, but for reading you know, a 14 year old who maybe has to read two chapters a night for school, may not be able to keep up that pace with that significantly reduced field. So looking at something like an auditory format or braille would be another option as well to be able to keep up with that volume of uh, print that child might be able to see. Um, that, that would be primarily for the reading portion of it. Um, those children typically also have issues with mobility and everything else. No, that wasn't what you asked about, but kind of looking, if we're just looking at near magnification um, and near devices, contrast enhancement, making sure you don't magnify outside of the field. And if you're not able to be fluent, and that's where you look at reading rates, looking at something like an auditory or braille assessment for that child to be able to keep up with the volume of reading that they have. Okay. Um, is there any mobile apps for low vision patients? There are a lot of apps for low vision patients um, and they kind of keep coming out um, pretty regularly and the ones that are, have been out are actually very, um, they keep improving on themselves. So, so a few things that you might want to look at if you have a moment, if you go onto your app store, you'll see um, some apps that I would maybe recommend to look into. There's one that's called Seeing AI. So S-E-E-I-N-G-A-I, -E -E letter A, letter I. It's from Microsoft and it's a free app. So that's important too. Because it has everything from a document reader built into it. It has a lighting um, uh, calibrator. It has color identifiers. Um, it has a little bit of everything built into it. It also has a handwriting reader, which is also, I think as far as I know, the only device, only app and think device that has handwriting recognition, which is pretty awesome. Um, there are apps that have um, put you in touch with somebody else. So like Be My Eyes, um, Tap Tap See is another one as well. And in some situations, you can actually just adapt the phone itself um, for um, large print by changing the text size, contrast. You have a task light that's built in, like an LED light that's built into most um, iPhones. So you could use that as well um, for adaptation. But feel free to email me. I have a list um, and actually another presentation about different apps that are available that I can put together a list of things maybe to start with for you. But those are the big ones that I, I typically look at. Um, how do I choose, how to choose the best device for both distance and near for a child? So to start with the best distance device, um, there's two forms of magnification. One is, well, there's three. So using a device would be 
typically a telescope um, would be the best one to look at. And I usually start with my calculation to figure out what power I need. And that's going to give me a, to have them meet their goal. Some kids have a hard time with the field of view with the telescope because it kind of limits your field of view. You're kind of looking almost through like a pinhole or like a keyhole of the door. So it can be challenging with kind of adapting to that new field. So I might start with a lower power telescope and build up to it. I typically do a lot of handheld devices for kids. Um, some of my colleagues like to do mounted telescopes, but I like to see how a child interacts with a device in their environment and um, kind of go from there. For near, um, essentially it kind of depends on what their goal is. Um, for, I feel like a lot of kids do really well with handheld devices, with some practice, with they figure out how to hold it the right distance. But I would probably say the majority of time I prescribe stand magnifiers or dome magnifiers. I like stand magnifiers because a lot of them have lights built into them because that gives a nice light source. But dome magnifiers are also nice because they're usually something that are easily held within a hand and they're easily moved across a page. So, and they don't really look that much different um, as like a stand magnifier or a handheld device might be. So if I had to pick the best low vision device for distance, the handheld telescope, and then for near, I'd probably do some type of stand magnifier to help that child see up close a little bit better. Um, how do you select the amount of tint and color in a tinted contact lens? So I work, our contact lens department is right down the hall from us. So this is um, a really fun uh, project that we like to work on. Typically what I do is I use um, filters from Chadwick um, or some of our fit over sun lens, fit, fit over lenses, and or noir, and have the child try that. And then what we try to do is send a sample of that with a clear lens to one of the companies that manufactures tinted contact lenses. And we have them match that. And in some situations, sometimes if they put too much tint in, we can send it back and have a little bit taken out. It is a laborious process, but it's a very um, worthwhile process to kind of go through um, when we do get to um, the type of lens that we finally prescribe, finally dispense that contact lens. Um, it does depend on the pathology and your patient's preference. So some conditions, like you may find that you're looking more towards a red, like a chromatopsia. Others, like, a, like somebody who has glaucoma, might like a yellow tint just to kind of take some of that glare away and enhance their contrast. But it depends absolutely on each one of them, and each patient that you see. Um, let's see, what tint do, do you recommend for people with albinism, retinitis pigmentosa, and why? So people who have albinism um, typically have normal color development. What we want to do is kind of reduce glare. So I usually find either a gray, because that doesn't distort remaining color vision, or amber is good because it reduces, kind of cuts those shorter wavelengths at the blue spectrum to give a little better contrast. Retinitis pigmentosa um, is a difficult one to kind of pick one color from because um, everybody's a little bit different and kind of what, what cells are still working and remaining in the back of the eye. But what I found with RP, that usually different shades of gray do pretty well. Amber sometimes does well. As, does well. But I also have found kind of like a rose color um, or like a pinkish color can sometimes be helpful. I don't know if it's just kind of like, a, it's just a little bit of a different mix of different wavelengths that for, to kind of come up with that one specific tint that makes people a little bit more comfortable. But I have found patients with RP like that rose tint. The primary thing is you want to make sure you have good coverage. So rather than just a pair of glasses and tinting the lenses, you want to make sure you have light coverage from the top and the sides, because if light comes in at a per perpendicular angle, it's going to scatter much differently and be much more difficult for people to um, deal with. So um, that's why you want to make sure that we do have um, good fit over um, options or call contact lenses for those patients. Um, let's see, how do you prescribe AIDS for children with cognitive problems such as Down syndrome and autism since subjective responses are unreliable? So prescribing devices, um, sometimes I don't find a device is helpful. I find strategies like large print or kind of adapting their environment so they can get closer to something. Like if they're watching television, giving them, like moving a chair closer they want, they want to see or giving them preferential seating. Um, it's, I might be able to get a better visual acuity with using a device, but how it's going to be functional and how if that child's actually going to use it, that's difficult to predict. So if a child has um, help at home, maybe they're working with an occupational therapist or a vision teacher, and I know they'll work with them, I might want to try a device, but it really depends on the level of cognition and kind of how much they're able to participate. 
autism um, is definitely um, a challenge in general. So it's one of those things that we want to make sure that we're giving an appropriate device that's going to work um, with that child's development. So if I can't get a device that works, then we use things like large print, using an iPad where we can make the print bigger, um, get magnification in a different way. Um, let's see, how can we help low vision ADHD patients who have some other comorbidities like learning disorder and all? So this is where working within a rehab team, like having a vision teacher and O&M specialist becomes much more um, important, much more, I shouldn't say important, it becomes more crucial um, because kids with ADHD have good days and bad days where some days they might be a little bit more active, some days they might be a little bit less attentive, um, but it does, it does kind of make things a challenge. So what we wanna make sure is that we have reinforcement and help um, outside of just prescribing a device or, or recommending a resource, we actually have a vision teacher, another rehab specialist working with them to kind of reinforce everything that we're kind of working together as a team. So ADHD is, is challenging in and of itself, but we have ADHD in, you know, added with a, a visual impairment or other types of comorbidities. It does make, a, make it very difficult. You may find in some situations that you are gonna have shorter exams because perhaps, um, you're not going to be able to kind of get for if there's a day that a child's a little bit more hyperactive than others you may have a hard time kind of getting anything accomplished so you may find that you're doing kind of small smaller shorter um, uh, exams maybe instead of like one long exam maybe bringing that child back every couple of weeks and doing like a shorter 30 minute exam where you can kind of get a lot together um, before um, before they start to get distracted but that's a challenging one for sure um, when should I start to give devices to children when they start school or as soon as possible as children can handle them? So it's going to vary depending on your child um, that you're working with. Um, I have probably prescribed as early as four with kids, but it was a child who was able to um, use the device correctly. I was able to watch them use, it was a dome magnifier, they were able to use it correctly. They were able to use it across the page and see where they're at. The um, study that I referenced earlier, and it was a very small group of kids, but one of the things that they, they were looking at as early as ages two to three, um, which is very young. I think that would be very difficult to in, implement a device to be used um, at that young age, but um, at least starting to work with the idea of um, a child having a device and getting the parents used to that idea. Sometimes it's very hard for a parent to see that their child needs to use something to see regular um, objects. And so that's a challenge as well. So if you start to introduce the devices, you're going to also start to see how that child interacts with them. And you may find that they may be um, successful um, earlier than sometimes you expect. It's kind of like fitting contact lenses in kids. Some kids can do it at an earlier because they're more mature and more developed and they understand what they're being used for. Some kids just aren't at that point. So we just wait a little bit longer. And that's why we can coordinate with the school to make sure that if they're not looking at devices, we at least create an educational environment or in the environment at home to make sure they're able to see what they need to see. Um, I, so I saw a case of a boy who was diagnosed to have coronal, oh, I think this is the same one from before. Oh, I already answered that one, so I'm sorry. I didn't, I'm going to read it again. Um, just a request for the um, strategies for manners to behaviors, and what is the best option to curl UV by protection by prescription spectacle? So, um, a lot of lenses, and I'll say here in our optical that we use, um, and it's coming more prominent, is that there's UV um, coatings put into a lot of lenses. They're just built with it now, but not always. So one of the things would be um, if you're doing prescription spectacles, making sure you're requesting a UV coat. Or UV protection, and most of it's like up to 100%, which is great. Um, other things, when we're looking at sunglasses, you know, sometimes we'll just say, well, I don't say this, and you won't say this. Some people will say, just go get a pair of sunglasses at um, the store. But the challenge is, is like something like a sunglass doesn't have, if it doesn't have UV protection built into it, like it has like a just specific certification of 100% UVA, UVB protection. With glasses, we don't have that luxury of having it labeled or not. So we as a doctor would need to prescribe that to make sure it's added in there. And then also um, making sure the parent also understands too that should they go ahead with um, um, getting sunglasses if they don't get them through you that have UV protection to make sure they look for that UV protection um, significant, significant, um, 
signification. That's it, I think. Okay, um, let's see. When do you prescribe multitasking video magnifiers to children? Um, so, actually, we start kind of young. I think the youngest that I've had um, is about six years old. Um, we have a program, if you haven't heard of them, um, to look them up, it's called Sight Savers America. Um, and they are working with us and as well as many clinics throughout the US um, to help provide the multitasking video magnifiers for children. So we use a device that has a three-in-one camera. So the specific one we use most, most commonly in clinic, I think I can say this, I don't wanna get in trouble, but Onyx HD, um, it's an, it has a nice screen, but it also has a really good camera that can be adjusted for distance viewing or you know, kind of looking at somebody's face, like a child's face on the intermediate, as well as looking at something up close. Um, the camera itself is pretty easy for kids to use. Um, there, it's just, it moves rather easily. It can be adjusted to um, different distances. And once the hardest part, I think, is just getting kids to kind of use the screen appropriately because they're so used to getting close to what they need to see that they kind of look down like this. They forget to look at their screen. Um, but that's one of those things that perhaps to kind of keep in mind um, when you're training it, they are able to kind of use the screen as kind of their um, their video their their viewing point. Um, but yeah, you can start as an early age, and it may not be something that's appropriate for the child that you're seeing, but maybe as they get developed, they get a little bit older, um, that might be um, helpful as well. Um, polarized glasses protect from UV. Um, polarized glasses are intended primarily to um, protect from glare. Um, I would have to check to make sure, I'm not 100% sure that just being polarized always corrects for UV because you can have non-polarized glasses that have UV protection. And I think you can have polarized glasses that don't have UV, but it would ha you'd have to check with your optical or check with the company. I'm not 100% sure. And I honestly did not um, prepare that part when I looked up, but I will definitely look into that when I get a free minute. So um, are there any other questions? Okay. Well, I think thank that's you, it. everybody, for all your great questions, and thank you for your attention. And by all means, please feel free to send me an email um, if you have any additional questions. And I appreciate everybody's time this morning. Thank you.